As an aspiring storyteller, you've looked at a completed show or movie at one time or another and thought to yourself, I could write a story even better than this while sleeping on the toilet. And while I do agree that most great ideas come to me on the crapper, when you sit down to put pen to paper, squeezing out a single word is more difficult than pressing out last night's seven cheese tater tot casserole. But how is this possible? You had a great concept, a lovable character, or a never-before-seen magic element. Shouldn't the ideas just possess your fingers and spill out onto the page like all of those self-help seminars said they would? <sighs> oh god, to be young and optimistic again. Storytelling is a lot like pulling surgical stitches out of your butt cheeks. It's irreverent, painful, frustrating, and most of the time it feels like you have no idea what's going on. But the pain is oddly satisfying, and at the end of the day, once you get all the string out, you have yourself a nice piece of dental floss. So, to get you guys started writing this masochistic masterpiece, we're going to look at several strands of Attack on Titan, and how we might use these strands to get started on our own stories. I'll be pulling from some of my experiences in storytelling to give as graphic of a portrayal as possible when it comes to creating a story from scratch. And, for each strategy, we're going to summarize how it fits into your overall story so that you can get started at any stage of storytelling. Let's start picking at the strand I think we all would like to focus on as our first point, starting from a random concept and making it into a story. This is the Danny DeVito strategy of storytelling, short, abrasive, but well-rounded. Every possible outcome is enticing, but our story can end up a hairy mess if we don't rein it in. In all honesty, if I thought about giant naked people running around eating normal-sized people, my first thought wouldn't be, hell yeah, this is gonna redefine a genre. I'd be more inclined to think, this is one of those thoughts I should just stuff down with my hopes and dreams and never mention them to anyone. And yet here we are, discussing one of the most popular anime series ever made, where the fundamental premise is, giant naked people eating regular people, and the regular people don't have a solution. Right off the bat, we have a problem. This isn't a story, it's a situation. We have a lot of naked cannibals and yelling and trips to therapy with this situation, but I could have just stayed in college if this is all I wanted from a story. What we need to do is tweak our premise, just the slightest bit, so we don't just have a party at a frat house, but rather a profound story about the endless cycle of war. This change in the premise is as follows. Giant naked people eat regular people, and the regular people don't have a solution until their most emotionally volatile citizen gets superpowers. So we add nine more words, and now we have ourselves a tale for the ages. Why is that? Well, contrary to the beliefs held by the writers at Marvel Studios, flashing lights and loud noises don't make a story. It's like a diet of caffeine and cigarettes. All fun, but no substance. In giving one character the opportunity to save humanity, we give our story a theme of hope. And in making that one character morally questionable, we get to walk a razor's edge for the entirety of the story, wondering if the tale is one of hope or futility. As a storyteller, this is going to feel like standing at a fork in the road, where one road leads to book deals and groupies at Barnes & Noble, and the other leads to the back of the line at the food bank. But I have good news and bad news. The good news is that we don't take either road in storytelling. Not until the very end. Aaron's moral compass leaves a lot of room for us to think he's a great guy doing the right thing one second, and then the next second we think he might not have the cojones to go through with the rumbling, and he's going to leave witnesses to his flat earth project gone awry. Why we do this as storytellers is because we're abusive, and we never give our audience an answer until we absolutely have to. This way, they get to worry for the entirety of our story as to what Aaron will ultimately do, and we get to smile while holding all of the power crystals. This leaves us with the bad news, which is that whichever road you take, they both lead to the food bank. Apparently nobody reads anymore, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't write a great story. Now what if you don't have a full story yet? Maybe you only have a scene, one small slice of a moment that makes you feel all warm and important like when Father Ken let you be his special altar boy. Well then, that would be strategy number two, starting with an end goal in mind. So let's roll back the clock to 17 years old. Your whole life is before you, and you've got plans to go to college, become a doctor, marry your current girlfriend because you're soulmates, stay best friends with your high school buddies, and throw weekly bangers at the mansion you'll buy when you turn 21 because debt isn't a thing. How's, uh, how's that plan working out for you, Andrews? Hmm? Doing alright? Yeah, no, you'll be fine. 
You can see the end goal that you want, or at the very least, a scene you want to experience along the way, and you can then work backwards to where you are now. What's great about storytelling and not so great about life is that in storytelling, you control anything and everything that happens. Even the people. You're a god, but without all the chanting and incense and crazy followers. Not you, Barnes & Noble groupies. You can stay. So let's take a scene from Attack on Titan and work it back to the beginning. Ironically, the scene Eren really wanted to see, and the scene that half the audience wants to forget. A first concept might look like two best friends talking about the pros and cons of curb stomping the entire world population as they stand in a red ocean. One will need to be for the plan, and the other will need to see the impracticality and time it will take, not to mention how bad your feet would hurt. And that's a valid point, so let's take that argument away. What if we had a whole crew of giants that would curb stomp on our behalf? Another way to think of this would be, what if two friends had the power to end all oxygen use on Earth? What are the arguments for and against doing it? Well, let's keep moving backwards. There's obviously some good reasons for not bulldozing the entire world, and there are also some bad reasons for bringing it all to an end. So let's not state the obvious and throw those arguments off the table. Conversely, let's consider what are some good reasons for kickstarting Earth 2.0, and then look at some bad reasons for letting the whole mess keep running. If we start over, everyone has a fair chance at survival. But if we let it keep going, there's a sizable chunk of the population that is going to get eaten alive. These are both valid arguments that can hold their own against the obvious argument that turning 80% of the world into fertilizer is mean, even though we've all definitely thought about it every day while in traffic, on our way to the job we hate, all the time, non-stop, even now. Where am I? The point of this step is to add tension to the scene. It's not enough to have two friends at the end of the world high-fiving over a job well done. There needs to be conflict. Once we consider what this conflict might be, i.e. the pros and cons of hitting the reset button, we can backtrack this argument all the way back to high school when our characters are 17 thinking about what their lives are going to be like in four years. We as the writers need to ask ourselves what events need to happen in the time between who these two characters were at the story's start to make them into the characters we see in this scene. Were they always friends? Were they always enemies? Did one experience something that the other character didn't to change their perspective? Maybe something like seeing all potential futures and deciding this was the one they liked most because it's an oceanside view with free teeth. When we decide we want to tell a story around a scene, we are producing a bottleneck or setting a target, like Barnes & Noble groupies. We know what we want, we just need to then figure out a path to get there. Pro tip. This scene might be where you start spitballing your ideas, and then it might never actually take place. Do not nail yourself down to anything in storytelling. We are all whores in this business, changing our minds for what feels best and letting go of story ideas we were once so fond of. Just let it go, Elsa. But if you hold on to a concept harder than my ex holds on to a grudge, maybe starting with a scene isn't the right place for you and your story. You're a writer with commitment issues, which means you should consider starting with strategy number three. Figure out a character and their arc. One of the story tropes that's been getting a lot of attention in the past few years is the anti-hero. More specifically, in the case of Aaron Yeager, is the Dark Messiah, which to my disappointment is not a type of chocolate cake or code for Black Jesus. After you outgrow the idea that one person can change the world, you just start to wish one person could do whatever they wanted and get away with it. This is called puberty, and usually takes place after the fifth or sixth rejection from the girls on the chess team. Fortunately for us, and unfortunately for the rest of the world, Parody doesn't have a chess team, so Aaron just has to settle for watching his mom lose a fight to his stepmother. Now, obviously, the concept for Aaron didn't start with, what happens when a boy watches his dad's lover fight one another? That's a different kind of storytelling. Instead, we'll normally approach a character with a conundrum or philosophical question, which, in Aaron's case, is simply, how far would you go to protect the people you care about? Let's consider how the answer to this question gets us different stories. If Aaron were like most of us, he'd say, I'm going to live a safe and quiet life so neither of my friends are at greater risk of dying. Maybe I'll move a few walls deeper into the city. If Aaron were slightly more ambitious, he might say, I'm going to join the Survey Corps alone and take on the Titans myself so that neither of my friends is at greater risk. 
But since we want a big, bombastic story with a world beyond the world our characters don't even know about, we need Aaron to be willing to go far. Like scorched earth and atomic wing seasoning in your cornea far. And, to do that, we need to make Aaron the type of character that would say, Anything or anyone that threatens my friend's safety will be obliterated like the toilet at TGI Fridays. That's a direct quote from the manga. Don't pretend like you read it. By taking our hero's views to the extreme, we create higher stakes, greater character drives, and plenty of opportunity to expand the scope of our story. Your character should always seem a little crazy by normal standards. They're getting an entire story for crying out loud. If they aren't weird or interesting, then why the hell am I going to follow them around? Once you determine the driving question for your hero and their determination, you can then build a story moving forward, asking what events should happen to cause Aaron to second-guess his decision. And you can also work backwards, asking yourself what events need to have happened in your hero's life to make them so adamant about this decision. For Aaron, moving forward, we ask ourselves, what do you mean when you say anything? And when looking back at his life, we ask ourselves, would watching your mom get crunchitized cause someone to unpeople 80% of the world? Or should we maybe add some other fun little traumas in there, like losing his team, getting betrayed, and watching his buddy fall to the power of his stepmom as well? But maybe you're thinking to yourself, what if I don't care about a character or scene or concept? What if I just want to live in a world where stepmoms can eat people? And again, that's not this kind of story. However, if you're adamant about making magic on the big screen or book or script or whatever, then let's look at our final strategy, starting with a magic system. When starting with a magic system or fantasy element, whether your story is already entering its third trimester or you have zero ideas beyond, I want meat Gundams, the approach is approximately the same. I'm going to assume you have your fundamental magic concept in mind, and now, instead of thinking what your magic can do, we're going to consider what your magic can't do. In fact, we're going to take it one step further. We're going to look and see how your magic is making life hell for everyone in your story. In Attack on Titan, the magic system is the fantasy concept of giant cannibals. The magic is causing a problem for our heroes. Even if you, as the writer, know that these giants are kind of the mindless good guys, that's not what we lead with. Magic's limitations and drawbacks are what get a story rolling. If we have magic users, it means that there is a magical Hitler. If we have magic creatures, then they aren't all cuddly. If we have a magical closet that goes to a faraway land, there's a war going on in that land. Whether it's fighting to stay in the closet, overthrowing the wizarding Third Reich, or enslaving all Pokemon to your will, the problem with your magic system is going to be what creates the conflict in your story. For Attack on Titan, the Titans are a magical mindless weapon. You could tell a similar story about toddlers with scissors if you really wanted to. It's like having an atomic bomb button hooked up to a game of Guess Who. Both sides are playing blind, trying to figure out who does and doesn't have control of these hungry, hungry idiots. And, the first one to guess right wins the game and sets off the nuke wherever they feel like. This gives you a timer and a race against the clock for both sides to get control over these gluttonous morons, and the stage is set for a story to take place. You might not know the players yet, you might not know the deeper concept of cyclical war and nihilism, but you know that your magic is something that is causing conflict, and how you go about resolving that magical conflict with a magical solution will give you an idea of what sort of story you can tell. My first book started this way, where I just wanted to write a different version of Pinocchio, and I swear that my first thoughts were, I'm just going to write the crappiest story possible from start to finish. That being said, I still had a question about the magic system that ran my character's life and the lives of the people around him. Why does everyone hate my main character so much? While this flaw in the magic system is kept a mystery for a good chunk of the story, it still was able to produce the conflict which drove the story forward for the first 150 pages or so. So, in your own writing, just remember that you don't need all of the answers when you start. Hell, you don't even have to start at the beginning. Just consider all the possible ways that things can go wrong in your story. Worry less about how things may go wrong in the actual writing process. And remember that, no matter where you start, we'll all end up in the same food line together, hungry and groupie-less. I'll save you a spot, though. Don't worry. Thank you guys so much for watching. 
Please share this video so I can make more people feel uncomfortable with my metaphors. And until next time, keep telling the best stories possible. The end.